gas pressure decay test is up here by the crossover portion of the combustion tube. And we'll look at some of those failures. But the real, the real concern, some odd reason you don't have a good spray pattern, if fuel is able to pool inside of this combustion tube, this inner liner, it's able to build up a little bit of fuel, it starts to leak out a crack, and it's able to get into ducting that is, uh, the ducting is really uh, a big part of the problem because the ducting does not resist heat now that it's 50 years old or so. There are safety switches on the heater that keep it from over, I mean there's an overheat switch, if it reaches 400 degrees that will pop that switch, it will shut the ignition down. There's an upper limit switch that's supposed to regulate it at around 250 degrees. But these switches go bad, uh, oftentimes. Uh, they just have spring steel in them that actuates them, and that spring steel gets pitted and it gets rusty. Uh, and a lot of times the points also will arc. And when the points arc, then you have this switch uh, not performing any kind of safety function. Um, the overheat switch is only as good as the fuel solenoid, so if this trips, shuts the fuel solenoid down. If that solenoid is uh, past the overhaul date, uh, the, the gaskets, the O-rings, the, the seals um, on the plunger, everything's dried up and brittle and it won't, it, most of the time or a lot of times it won't stop the fuel from running into the can even though your safety switches have tripped. Uh, another concern uh, in the AD that they, uh, we've been talking about, AD is 810909, uh, this combustion air switch. Uh, this is made that if there's not enough airflow to burn, to get a good burn, a, a clean burn, uh, this switch is supposed to actuate and shut off all components that would uh, allow for burn, uh, including fuel and ignition. Um, these switches also are getting old, they're just past their prime. There's no time date on these heaters, uh, so nobody, uh, unless it's overhauled by a, a repair station that knows what they're doing, nobody many times knows to look at these switches very well. Uh, and instead of clicking up at a third of their throw, uh, many times they'll, they'll click open or they'll hold open, uh, and again that safety feature is also uh, no longer effective. I like that one. You could see uh, inside and see it actually um, lit, burning. So you can see what the uh, the Janitrol. <clears throat> and again, that one dealing with the uh, the uh, jet or not the jet fuel, but the low lead fuel. So it's more like a uh, regular spark plug. So for next week, we're going to get into um, some troubleshooting, and we're going to troubleshoot um, the 310 uh, flap system for um, the electrical side. So what I wanted to do was just give you a little bit of uh, information on the 310 flaps so you have an understanding how they work before you get into the troubleshooting. So if you aren't sure, there's the 310, Cessna 310, which is a twin engine uh, aircraft, which we did have. Um, we don't have it anymore, but. Um, so the 310 has the, <coughs> the flaps that come out of the uh, trailing edge. So we can see this. So it has electric gear and it also has electric flaps. So the flaps come down again out of the trailing edge of the, the wing.
again, this one you can see a little bit better uh, coming out the off the wing and down. Oops. So again, looking from the back, you can see them uh, sticking down. Used to, we could do a whole, um, you go through the measuring of the angles as you extend the flaps. So if we look at um, how they select the flaps and how they indicate. So looking at the, the dash, you can see we have um, the switch. Um, we have a, a setting, so you up uh, 15 to 35 degrees. And again, the selection switch goes down and um, selects the flap setting. So you get a different idea. There's another one, a little better picture. You can see the needle pointing at the up position. And then we have the selector on the right-hand side where you'd select it, push down, and it moves the flaps down and to the correct position, and then you let go. Or you push back up, and it moves up, and then you let go. So if we look what actually is happening in behind that panel, you can see we have a bunch of micro switches. So this, I can, this right here is your selection lever. So that goes out to the panel at the front. So you're, if you look at the, right, the pivot. So if you're pushing up, it would activate on the uh, micro switch to cause it to move. When it actually moves, this lever actually physically moves up or down. How it does that is by this, this cable right here. So this cable is rooted down through the panel, through the floor and back to the mid floor where the flat motor is. This is the actual needle. So the needle is uh, on this arm, which is attached to a physical cable. So if you push the flap selector switch up, this cable would be moving and the flap switches would move as well. So again, it's a little bit uh, different of a system. And then as you let go of the when you let go of the flop selector, it would come off of the two micro switches. So these two switches are the up and the down. And as you push the, the lever, it's going to hit one or the other and cause it to physically move the, the switches as well. And also it's moving the indicator. So here you can see the, um, there's the flap switch and then the cable. So there's my indicator, which is attached to that lever, which is attached to the cable. And that cable runs down and back to the, 
the motor. On the left, or sorry, the right hand side is the actual selection. And that uh, again is, is hitting the up or down switch, whichever you select. So if we look into the, uh, the center of the floor, we have a simple DC motor that is going to move the flaps in or out according to your selection. So now this works off of a chain so the motor actually has a chain that goes to either side of the, the wings to move the flaps together. I think the next one shows you, but uh, what you need to see in this one, you can see this right here. Um, you'll notice the bolts have um, a, a slot. So if you can see right there, that's a micro switch. So those are the uh, up and down limit switches. So they're adjustable. So you have to adjust those to make sure that you've hit the up limit or the down limit according to the angles, which is important or you start to damage things, right? Moving micro switches. So this one shows you, you can see the chain kind of the chained gears on the teeth of this uh, motor. That's the front side. So we got one chain going one direction and a chain going the other to move the, uh, the flaps. This one you can see, there's your micro switches again, depending on the movement. And there's the chain drives that go out to the wings. So because of that, um, let's see if I can. So how does it actually work? So it's pretty simple. Um, we have a DC motor. Um, we have our selection switches in the cockpit. And then we have our two limit switches. So we got power coming from our main bus through our 10 amp breaker. Notice we got uh, labels on the wires, C16B20. And then we got C16C20. So remember every time a wire goes through a connection, it uh, changes the letter segment. We learned that before. We have a P and a J. So that means it's gone through a, uh, a connector and it's on pin 18 and that's why it changed the letter. So voltage comes through, goes to the first um, switch and it also feeds the other switch. So we have power at both switches. Now depending on which you want Want to go up or down with your flaps. If you select down, when you push the, the lever to the down position, it moves the power through 17 and then 17A. Now, if the flaps are not down, then the limit switch would be connected. 
So the limit switch is connected and we apply power to the motor. So the motor will turn one direction and it has a ground. So the motor is allowed to turn that direction and then once the motor has fully moved the flaps, it pushes the micro switch and opens the circuit. So now it can't go down any further. And even if you select down again, um, the limit switch has, has caused it not to go any further. So again, the, very important that the limit switches are adjusted correctly. So plug one, jack one, again in a connector. Uh, you would typically assume in this case it would be straight across 18 to 18, unless they've told you anything different. Um, the limit switch, again, down at the motor. So as the motor gets to its full down position, it physically contacts those micro switches to move it to the full down position. So now it can't go up down any further. So you have to select the upside. So now the pre-selector at the front, right? You can't have one or the other. So you can only have one or the other, you can't have both. So once you select up, it would go to the upside. And again, the if it's in the full down position, then the upside is closed. So again, it would allow the motor to spin the opposite direction and it would allow the flaps to come back up. So some of the tools we talked about before, right? If you know what works and what doesn't work, that can give you a lot of information. So if you know it does half of the job or the other half, that can tell you a lot of things about the circuit. Um, we talked about testing, right? Voltage is usually your first choice because it's simple and easy. It's quick. You can quickly go to voltage measurements and that can tell you um, basically the right area or the right component to check. Once you narrowed it down to a component, most likely then you can pinpoint it exactly by using resistance. Remember to turn your power off and check your resistance. Again, once you're close, um, that could confirm your, your guess. Is that the right problem? Uh, current, again, it's usually a specialized circumstance. Why would I need current? Um, only if it's a, a situation where you're drawing excessive current or currents leaking all the time, draining your battery. So your two main things would be voltage and resistance. Um, the two methods or the methods, right? Sequential, if you go in step by step from the start to the beginning to the end, right? We found out we had issues with that, right? It takes a while. Um, the shotgun approach, that's always a good one. Just uh, randomly pick things all over the place. Um, halfway. Right, so find a spot somewhere halfway through the circuit and check uh, usually voltage to see if you got voltage there or not. And then you have basically a direction to go. Can I go continue on or do I need to go back halfway? Um, for troubleshooting really hasn't worked yet. They still don't work well. No comments, so. So 
So next week, um, we'll be implementing uh, your troubleshooting skills to the fullest. So <clears throat> again, be ready. So one of the things, right, is common areas. Common areas can eliminate um, problems for you. So if one side works, but not the other, you could tell me that A, you have power all the way to here, you know that, and B, that the motor actually works. So again, by uh, looking at what information is given to you or what information you can get by uh, testing the problem, that can get you to a good area to start. So be ready for next week because we will uh, be able to um, get some of the restrictions like time, right? What was another constraint that had issues when troubleshooting? Time is a big one. Money. Money. And you'll figure out how I'm going to implement money into this. <laughs> um, so we have time, we have money. What about your will to live, Brad? I feel like that dwindles pretty quickly. Uh, I can, but uh, the excitement seems to keep you going. Oh, okay. So it's not too bad then. <laughs> it's not too bad, yeah. I, I can keep an eye on it and then and, uh, and spark your interest quickly. What was the other one we had? Manpower, Resources. Right? Resources. Um, we're a little limited on resources, but I believe we still have um, the 310 manual on the uh, laptops. I'll double check, but we do still have that resource available. Um, if you're real serious, you could... Uh, Take a field trip to the paintball paradise <laughs> and look at it yourself um, now that we don't have it. But uh, that was a good one when it was here. You actually had the aircraft you could go look at. Anything else we could do? What about that uh, talking to the old guy, right? Someone that's worked on it. Well, I'm not going to give up too much, but. So, I did open up another section on the Janitrol as well, if you didn't notice. Um, so, I'll upload that um, PowerPoint so you have it, so you can go through it again uh, to see how it works. Your quizzes are due tomorrow. So, there's two. Thanks. Uh, for all the information you guys gave me that the troubleshooting quiz was not even on last week. So I put them both on. It was hidden. I thought it was all there, but you guys never told me. Thinking you get out of it. 
So you have those two to finish. I don't know, I may have another one as well. So I'll see what else is available for you. See how much you know about the, the Janitrol and how it works. Other than that, if we have no questions, um, we're pretty much done for this week. We'll see you in the lab uh, troubleshooting, pulling your hair out. Uh, has anyone had interesting uh, problems on their latching circuit? I know of one. Relays. <laughs> wow, that was quick. You knew it was coming, Brad. I knew it was coming, yeah. So you want to explain or should I? You would probably explain it better. All right. So um, Zane had an interesting one it, um, with his uh, latching circuit. Now, um, his first problem was he had his lights were reversed, which was, it was okay. Um, the terminal blocks were not the same. So he adapted his drawing to make sure it matched, which he, he did well. And then um, he noticed right away that his relay was broken. The, the cover came off. So um, we replaced that uh, with a new one. And then I guess it was last week, he just got to try to put it together. And one of the screws on the relays um, wouldn't thread in. So the threads were stripped. So he had to put a whole new base in. So he went ahead, put a new base in, put the new relay in, wired it all up, and sure enough, it didn't work. So, which is normal, right? Sometimes it doesn't work as planned, but um, Brett had wired his exactly the same as, as Zane's. And Brett worked the first time, no problem. And Zane went through and checked every connection to make sure it was exactly the same. So that was which was, uh, I think, um, kind of confusing him because everything seemed to be exactly the same. And why did his work and his didn't? So we started to troubleshoot it. And we had issues right away. Like I said, it wouldn't. We had one light always staying on wouldn't go off. It switched, but it wouldn't go off. So we looked and looked, we tried re rewiring it. And then at one point we switched the, um, the light. And when we switched the light on the relay, um, the light that was staying on actually switched. So at that point, um, we knew that the problem wasn't in the beginning of the circuit. We knew it was at the relay or, or around there. So again, we knew we had power. We knew the relay was working. It just wasn't turning the light off. So at that point, what we did is because the relay has uh, four contacts, um, we moved uh, the relay that the light that was staying on we moved it to the second or the extra set of contacts. And sure enough, the circuit worked properly. So again, um, because the circuit was built exactly the same as another one that worked, it was a little confusing. And because we had already put a new relay base and a new relay in it, we assumed that the relay was good, which ended up not being true. So the thankfully Brett built that other circuit though, because I would have just thought that my design was faulty. Yeah. So again, that one kept him going that his, he knew that it worked his, his, I guess I would say you shared a little bit of information with Brett on how to build that circuit, right. On how to make their lights work because they were different terminal blocks. Yeah. We kind of helped each other. It was like yeah. a mutual bond there. <laughs> so that was like, and again, another thing that we, always went back to is how come that one works and this one's not working, but I don't think we ever took the relay out again. Right. We never actually switched the relay. 
No, yeah, we never switched the relay. We, we just never actually to took contacts. it out because, again, we thought it was new, thought it was good. So it kind of shows you that even that it's a brand new relay, now say brand new, they've been sitting in the box, but how much were they? hundred bucks, someone said. So those hundred dollar relays coming out of the box, like I said, brand new. And that one first set of contacts was probably shorted or something. So every time it switched, the light one would stay on, light two would come on, but it would never turn off light one. So it was interesting and uh, even got uh, got me uh, thinking, but uh, we didn't give up. We got it fixed. Right? Yeah, and I'll be sending you the email right now for the picture. <laughs> oh, the pictures of it? Yeah. All right. It wasn't too beautiful because I had to uh, account for those different contacts that we used, but uh, it was it still made it. Still made it work, yeah. And we were a little bit over on time, so we were still working at it, so yeah. Anyone else have some interesting uh, 